When, when I uh, am searching the scriptures and like there was a well-known uh, pastor who spoke to us back in February at a day of refreshing. There was about, I guess, 60 or 70 local pastors at uh, this time of refreshing up in the mountains of North Georgia. And um, Crawford Loretz was the guy who was speaking to us. He used to pastor at Fellowship Bible Church over in Roswell. And he said, as pastors, on Sunday, you have to hopefully hear from God and you have the word of the Lord. And he says, as you go through your week, Sunday's coming. And uh, now, if I was an evangelist, you go from town to town, you could preach the same message every Sunday or every time you're in, a, and, and everybody, oh, he has some fresh meat, you know. And he's preaching the same sermon he's been preaching for the last 10 years. And uh, hopefully that's not the case, but I find that to be true. Uh, I'm not going to mention the evangelist. He's not here with us now. He's in the presence of God. But I was in one city, heard what he said, went to another city, and he is saying the same thing. He doesn't he need to open the Bible. <laughs> he memorized it, you know. So I'm saying, God help me. And... Uh, so I worked on a sermon uh, this week. I must have spent, I had maybe six or seven hours, did all this research and got to the end of it. And I said, this ain't going to work. And uh, I memorized it's in my head that could tell you what I was thinking. But so um, anyways, I had to change of course. And so I spent a great deal of time on uh, Friday evening and then Saturday so I want to talk to you from the book of Galatians. And uh, Paul in 49 AD wrote this circular letter to this church, to the churches in Galatia, which is North Central Asia Minor. So if you're looking at a map of the Holy Land, you would see Israel, and then you look north of Israel, and you go up further several hundred miles and you find there was a church, a bunch of churches in Galatia. And there was a problem uh, in the, many of those churches. And what happened was the gospel of Jesus Christ was being perverted by false teachers called Judaizers. And essentially what they were doing, it says, okay, uh, we understand and recognize the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that... What Jesus Christ did for all of us who know him, who are of the elect, it says that he came and God came in human form, Jesus Christ, and identified with us, was tempted as we are tempted, but he did not sin. He was the perfect Passover lamb. In the Old Testament, the Passover lamb was for us to recognize the shedding of a sacrificial animal, a lamb, a goat, a young bullock, whatever, to wash away our sins, but it was not finalized. It wasn't complete. It had to be done over and over and over again. Jesus comes a sacrifice once and for all. And so he identified with us. He gave his life. No man took it. He gave it. He forfeited it. Became a martyr for us. He went to hell for us. He died, but praise God, the power of the Holy Spirit brought him out of the grave, and he's alive. Ascended into the heavens, but the good news is he reigns and rules in heaven Earth is footstool, and he lives in our hearts and lives, not in a tent, not in a temple. We're not going to go back. We're going forward, and he lives in our hearts and lives. And Paul was preaching that gospel message to the Gentiles, but what happened, these false teachers came in and said, yes, you have to recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also you got to be circumcised. Well, circumcision, the old covenant, was part of a sign that you're in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. 
in the New Testament talks about the circumcision of Christ. He does surgery on our hearts so our thoughts, propensity, desires are towards him. So we're positioned towards him. It's a spiritual cutting away of that carnality in the flesh. And God gives us the power of the Holy Ghost not to be a slave to sin but to live for God. And so what was happening, they were saying, yes, but you got to do this. They were going back and pulling things out of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament and putting it up on these new believers. And I believe that also they were probably putting other things up on them, even in the church today. You see, our relationship with Jesus Christ is justification by faith. When you look in the Old Testament, Abraham, he was looking to the cross. It says he was in right standing with God because he put his faith and trust and simply believed God and God reckoned it unto him as righteousness. The Old Testament minor prophet said justification is by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works. And so even now in the church, you got some who are well-meaning, but that says to finalize your salvation, you need to be regenerated by water baptism. Water will not wash away your sins. It's through the shedding of blood, Old Testament, that your sins are remitted. It's through the blood of Christ who gave his life that we can receive the washing away our sins. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west, past, present, and future. Amen? Unfortunately, even in the church today, people are going back. I think you've had it happen in, in this church over the years that people are going back and trying to put themselves in a better position with God and, in a sense, adding something to that work of salvation. You can't get any more saved than saved. Amen? And we had people who said, well, I don't know if my husband's like covering, so I'm going to put a veil over me so I can be more in a submitted relationship to Christ Jesus. That's an insult. Then we had people who would wear a certain clothes. They wouldn't mix linen with silk or cotton. And said, we, we got to incorporate some stuff from the old covenant that we can be in a more elite position to be in close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I even ran into a bunch of people up in Tennessee years ago, Christian people who were trying to raise some red heifers to send to Israel. And when you look at the ashes of red heifer, if you went to a funeral and you touched someone's body, you were contaminated, polluted. And so you had to get ashes from the red heifer, go to a priest and have that anointed. Then you stand outside the, the camp, wherever that is, for seven days so you could be reconciled back to God. And I said to those preachers up in Tennessee about gotten a fist fight. And I said, what are you wasting your money on red heifers? Why don't you do something right with it and forget that and put the money to good use where people can have a, a work of God, an act of kindness and blessing and lead them to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Make a good investment. And I mean, why go back and try to pull up parts of the ceremonial law so you can think that you can be more justified in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a lot of baloney. Now, what Jesus did on the cross, he fulfilled the ceremonial law and the civil law that Israel was bound to that we see illustrated so clearly in the Old Testament. What he didn't do away with was the moral law, the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Sabbath. And you have people who camp out on the Sabbath trying to say, well, that's the only day and the true day of worship. Here's what Jesus said about the Sabbath. 
He said, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for the man. And you find your rest not in the day. You find your rest in me. Isn't that a lot better? Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. The reason we celebrate and worship the Lord on the first day of the week because it, it illustrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, if someone wants to have a worship service every single day, you should. Amen. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Hallelujah. You can do it when you get up in the morning and just lift your hands to the Lord. Say, I worship you. I love you. Hallelujah. Praise God. You don't have to wait until Sunday. But we get together as the body of Christ. So Paul was writing this letter to the churches in Galatia to say, look, if anyone else te preaches any other gospel, don't listen to that stuff. Look at the truth and heart of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. According to the scriptures, he lived, he died, he was buried, he came out of the grave. Hallelujah. Amen. And so to be born of God, he says you must repent. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. The word of faith is nigh in your mouth. And if you will turn to God, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the incarnation, God in human form. Amen. Confess that out of the abundance of the heart and the mouth, speak it. And then believe, put your weight, trust on God that the Father, the Holy Ghost, rose Jesus out of the grave. He ascended into the heavens. You believe you will be saved. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't make it work. God is the one who gives you repentance. He's the one that gives you faith. He's the one who calls you. He's the one who justifies you. He does everything. But you, in accordance with the sovereignty of God, must say, yes. You must yield to him every single day. And then he says, what I want you to do, Galatia, prayer and praise, I want you to live, I want you to walk, be led by the Spirit of God every single day. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Amen. In your Bibles, on your iPhone, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Living in the Holy Ghost. So I say, verse 16, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit which it what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are you're not under the law of Moses. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They have not been regenerated, renewed by the Holy Ghost. Their life, their actions, their behavior consistently spells out these things. Maybe not all of them, but so, some of those things, many of those things, are active in the person who is yielding to the flesh and living their lives apart from God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Amen. Diana mentioned that this morning. Shannon mentioned that this morning. And it's manifested by joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Hallelujah. We are free in Christ Jesus, we have liberty not to sin, but to live for God. Amen? Amen? Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature, its passions and desires. As we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, 
provoking and envying each other. Bless the reading of God's word. So, what does it mean to live, walk, and be led by the Spirit of God? Ooh. You know, some people want to get spooky, you know. I've seen spooky Christians. Oh, let me lay hands on somebody. Oh, there's a demon in you. I got to get it out, you know. I remember <laughs> back in 1988 when me and a bunch of other radical, crazy Christians went down to Atlanta and we blocked an abortion clinic on Spring Street. And the cops came and there was a big hullabaloo and dragged us off. And I remember they threw us in jail down there in Fulton County Jail. And there was a bunch of crazies like me, spooky spiritual guys, you know. And uh, we're in the men's quarter and a woman walked by. I said, what is the lady doing here in the men's quarter. Well, that's not a woman. Well, what is it? And, it, well, it's someone who's a man that wants to be a woman. Oh, they go, oh, hallelujah. Let me put my hands on her or whatever. And these guys said, this is wonderful. We're going to cast this thing out, you know. And uh, I said, well, lay hands on no, um, no Man, woman, suddenly, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, what what I was so crazy was that um, you had a lot, a lot of guys, and they get kind of I'm being led by the Spirit of God. You had to use wisdom, and discretion. Here's the good thing, in spite of all the crazy stuff that had taken place, the move of God took place in Fulton County Jail in 1988. And we saw many people come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. A lot of stories. And my involvement was not something that I wanted to do. It was just how it presented itself as a long story to that. But I saw that God was using it prophetically to call attention to develop a litmus test. And you see now that when we have an upcoming election, one of the main things, no matter what party you're from, what's your position on the sanctity of life? I'm for life and not death. Amen? Now, the Bible is real clear. It doesn't come out and use the word abortion, but God hates things. One of the things he hates is the shedding of innocent blood the ab aborting a baby before it's born is shedding innocent blood and so what I saw happen through that year and a year and a half was a lot of good and glorious things happened and, and I know I'm running a rabbit here but I'm going to finish this rabbit story okay so I remember there's some ladies in our church were down picketing an abortion clinic and there was this lady who was going to go in and have an abortion. And some ladies in the church confronted her and said, this is not a good thing. You, you need to reconsider. They weren't being, they weren't attacking her. They were just reaching out with love with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a loving way towards her. She said, for me to have an abortion will cost me $300. For me to raise this child, which I can't, will cost me thousands of dollars. I remember the lady in the church called me on the phone and said, we want to help this woman and to keep this child and not abort this baby. I said, tell her what we'll do as a church. We will financially support her through this pregnancy. And then when she delivers that child, we'll find a family, a couple 
who will take the child. She agreed to do that. And we as a church took care of her, provided for her, saw her get the, the care she needed from the medical facility. And she gave birth to that child, and he's a young man today. He's alive. Someone said, well, you couldn't do that for everyone, but for that one, it was important. When one person, one person comes to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, the whole heavenly throne rejoices. That one person was important. Thank God for the obedience of our church at that point in time. So all that would happen, and a lot of, a lot of things happening then, a lot of stuff unearthed, and a lot of things come to the forefront, not just the abortion clinic, but a lot of corruption that was taking place in the city of Atlanta at that time. And then the election, and what happened? And so this church had a big part in taking a stand for righteousness. And when you do, it costs you. It cost you. And so, what I want to make sure that you and me, as followers of Jesus Christ, that every single day we're walking, living, and being led by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen? You don't have to be a flaming evangelist. You don't have to be the pastor of a church to be an emissary, to be a representative for Jesus Christ. You'll touch and talk to a lot of people that I never will. And we as a church, we put our time and resources together, everyone knowing their place and purpose in the body of Christ and being used to God to penetrate the darkness, which is so evident in our culture today. We celebrate the birthday of America, July 4th. And the sad thing I see as I look at what's happening in our country, even as I listen to the debate this past week, a house divided will not stand. Our nation is polarized big time. And unfortunately, America has resisted God, resisted our foundational principles of what our nation was established for and America is going further and further away from God. Now, the judgments of God are in the earth. Not to destroy, annihilate America. But judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And you see a lot of big celebrity pastors who are falling today. And judgment starts in the house of God. And the purpose of God's judgment is not to destroy us, but to bring us to a place where we realize we need God. We need to repent and yield and turn back to God. Now, the church of Jesus Christ is God's vehicle to usher in his kingdom. His kingdom is where the joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. To see that in my life, in your life, in our homes, in our church, in our community. And we have an opportunity here. We're not a big church. We're not the most, not the wealthiest church. We're one of the best churches. Amen? There's a lot of good churches in Cherokee County doing a lot of good works, doing good things, representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And just simply through this crazy idea of a garden that we have people coming here just give you an example. Had two ladies show up last week. They live right over here on Putnam Ford Road. And they came and said, we want to buy some green tomatoes. And Walmart, we couldn't find any at Walmart, Kroger, or Publix, or Lidl, or Aldi. We went to Walmart, and Walmart said, I can tell you where you get green tomatoes, right over next door. Walmart is working for us now. They came over here, and I'm so holy up in my office, I can't go down and deal with the proletariat, okay? But I did. 
And they said, we want some green tomatoes. Shannon, go out there on that ant hill and get some green tomatoes. No, Shannon can't do it. I went out there and got the green tomatoes and brought them back. I didn't say, I'm the pastor of the church. I've been here for 44 years. I don't say. I'm the janitor. That way they open up to me. So anyways, I went and got the green tomatoes, and I said, they're free. No, no, we want to bless you. I said, oh, then give me $100. That'll be fine, you know. <laughs> I didn't do that. So I, I just started up a conversation, and the Jesus in me said, I'm going to pray for you, dear ladies. There are sisters. And I laid my hands on them and prayed for them that God would bless them with good health and strength all the days of their life. And that God would meet them. Now, I didn't feel led to give them the plan of salvation and say, are you going to heaven or hell? Are you going to burn in the fire forever? Either turn or burn. I didn't say that. You'd be sensitive to you be led by the Spirit of God. You walk with the Spirit of God. You see an opportunity, and what you do, you begin to listen to the voice of God and speak to the need in those women's hearts and lives. That's being naturally supernatural. Natural, you just live your life. You see your limitations as a person. But you know you do something supernatural. You're the voice of God. You're the messenger of the Lord. You're the emissary of the Lord speaking into the life of people that you meet. Had a church come this week. He said, we want to do what you're doing. How do you do all this? There were five people there from another church. I know the pastor and they're taking notes. I said, well, I'm going to give you my secret as a master gardener. You just go out, and by faith, you throw the seeds in the air, and they fall to the ground, and this is what happens. It's automatic. It's automatic. And so I give them all my secrets, told them where I get the nitrogen for the garden, how we deal with bottom, bottom rot on the tomatoes, how we do this, how we do that. I said, we got good people in our church. We have an expert, a master gardener, has a greenhouse. He's the one who provides this. He turns the soil up and all that. Oh, what's his name? I said, oh, here's his phone number. Call him. He'll do anything you want. Poor John. No, I didn't do that, John. I didn't do that. So it takes a lot of people to do a great work for God. Now, here's what God wants. He wants you to walk and be led by the Spirit of God. Every person here has a calling. Every person here has a purpose. Every person here has a ministry. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have an MDiv or a THD or a PhD. You've got just to be a willing person. And the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you. Essentially what my sermon says, that the flesh and the spirit cannot coexist. They're opposites. I don't want to yield to the flesh. I know that I have things that flood into my mind. I know there are things that come against me where I might get angry or I say something I shouldn't say or do something I shouldn't do or have impure thoughts. So God says, be an overcomer, bring every thought subject unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I, I got a flash on my phone, a text message. And I knew where it was. It was coming from, it was probably a porn site or someone trying to make a suggestion to introduce her to me. I realized what it was. I said, I can't believe it. I got this thing. That's the enemy. That, that phone can be a blessing, can be a curse. So what I did, I deleted it. I can't believe it. Two days later, another flash on the phone. You see, that's appealing to the flesh. And what happens, that you have the power of the Holy Ghost because you're led by the Spirit of God 
Do not give place to the devil, it says in Ephesians. Don't even begin to investigate that or give one inch. The moment you do, there's a hook, just like when you go fishing. And what the devil wants to do, he wants to tighten that line and set the hook and pull you in. That's what happened to some of the great pastors in our community recently, a number of them. And one of them that I don't know him personally, but I know one of his elders who's a good friend of mine in that large church in Texas. And so what you have to do, it says, do not yield, Paul said to the churches of Galatia, don't yield to the passions of the flesh. Now he goes on to say, and he lists all 15 of them. We read it this morning. And what he says in listing all that, he says, if you live that way, it's evident that you're not born of God and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now you might say, my goodness, I did one of those things. I, 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 I had, I had some, some thoughts and things like that. But what the Bible says, if you're led by the Spirit of God, what you do, you don't give any attention or place to that. You submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Don't give it a second thought. Amen? Don't give it a second thought. You see... We're, one thing about going to heaven is when I, when I know that I'm close to my day of departure, I'm going to say, glory, hallelujah, I don't have to deal with the flesh anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I don't have to pay taxes anymore. Amen? I don't have to worry about a mortgage. I don't have to do this or that. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. But you know what? Today, now, I am not going to give any time and attention to the flesh. You see, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that you're a follower of Jesus, the one thing that stands out so clearly is this. The fruit, it didn't say fruits, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then it says, if that's true, then there's joy in your heart. Amen? There's self-control. There's peace and kindness, goodness, gentleness, all these things. Amen? And there's no law against these things. You're free to live and function in the things of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? That's, I mean, common sense tells me that's the right way. Amen? So what you do to be led by the Spirit of God, to walk in the Spirit of God, to live in the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, God, constrains you not to go to the way of the flesh, constrains you not to sin. Because Paul, in his dissertation in the book of Romans, chapter 6, says... You have crucified the flesh. You are no longer a slave to flesh. I give you power. Give you power to be more than a conqueror. To deal with all those things of the flesh. All those carnal things. I give you that power. But you have to, by faith, exercise that. You see, God is sovereign he doesn't violate our free will, but as a believer, your free will cooperates with the sovereignty of God. You do what God has ordained and planned for your life. So when you stand before God, I stand before God. I didn't waste my time, my life. I lived it as a follower of Jesus Christ. I walked in the Spirit. I lived in the Spirit. I was led by the Spirit of God. Amen? So three things I see that jump out to me, and I enumerated those things. At the conclusion, we are free from the desires of the flesh. One of the scriptures I memorized a long time ago was 
Romans 13, 14, it says, Therefore, make no place in your heart, or in the King James, provision in your heart and mind to do the ungodly things. I'm not going to make a place in my heart and mind. Now, I, want, I like watching movies. Sometimes my downtime is that I just don't want to do anything. I don't want to have to think. I sit there and I like to watch an old cowboy movie. I find movies back in 1952 don't have explicit words in it. I have all these expletives. It doesn't have all these ungodly scenes. And then you try to find something that's maybe more modern. You go, oh, I can't do that. They take God's name in vain. They have all sorts of garbage and all that. I have to go back and find something in 1948. Watch an old cowboy movie. But the thing is, the Word of God tells us that we have to put blinders on. When you look at the first psalm as a guideline how to live by the Spirit of God, don't put yourself in a place where they scorn the things of God, where they speak blasphemies, where they do all things. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't let your mind be infiltrated with that stuff. Block it out. Block it out. We're free from the law of Moses with all its rules and regulations. So, as I already mentioned to you, Jesus fulfilled the ceremony of civil law. One of the civil laws, you got a rebellious, in the Old Testament days, you had a rebellious son or daughter, and you dealt with them, you disciplined, corrected them, they kept just making all sorts of problems. So what you did, according to civil law, you took them to the elders. And they had court that day, and they found that young person guilty. You know what they did? They took them outside the city and stoned them. I go, well, that's not the Christian thing to do. If you were caught in an act of adultery, according to the civil law of the old covenant, it was death. Well, Jesus fulfilled that. He didn't do away with the law, but he fulfilled it. But he completed and satisfied the civil law, the ceremonial law. As I mentioned, he kept the moral law. And so what Jesus does when they are trying to put him under there's rules and regulation of the old covenant, and they brought a woman to him caught in the act of adultery. What did he do? Stone her! He looked at her and he said, where's your accusers? He forgave her and he said, you're free to go, don't sin anymore. God does that towards you and me. Even when you had dropped the ball, sinned, made a mistake. He grants repentance to you, meaning you say, Lord, I'm turning towards you. I ask you to forgive me. You're forgiven, never to be resurrected again. And you continue to walk in the Spirit of God. In my Christian life, in your Christian life, from the day that you were born again, have you ever made a mistake, a bad choice, a bad decision, dropped the ball? Yes, but you don't see that continual, ongoing characteristic in your life. Thank God he never gives up on us. Thank God his grace is sufficient. Thank God he never throws us under the bus. He loves us, cares for us, who reached down. He'll discipline us, he'll correct us, but he'll put us back on the road where it's straight and narrow leads to him, I say, hallelujah. Lord, I thank God that over the years he's protected me from myself. Thank God. He's put godly people in my life, other ministers, who know me inside and out, who hold me accountable. Thank God. Men of God who fall think I can't do that and that's the first make, mistake they make they have to recognize I'm a human being and I'm susceptible to dropping the ball and messing up God I need you every day 
and be open and transparent and present yourself before people. That's walking in the Spirit. That's being led by the Spirit of God. Amen? One of the main difficulties we have in life is controlling and dealing with what's happening between this ear and that ear, our thought process. Maybe you haven't acted it out, but in your mind, you've done atrocious things. Bring it captive unto the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen? We're free to live a life that demonstrates our love for God and others. The love of God, listen to this, the love of God constrains us to keep from sinning and allows us to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to live, I want to walk, and be led by the Spirit of God each and every day. That brings life. The flesh brings death, but the Spirit of God brings life. We need to yield to the Holy Ghost every single day. Amen? Please stand.